I want you to get together. Hello everyone. Today I have another video showcasing the folk traditions found around the world that represent the Nephilim and their spirits through their choices of clothing and makeup worn during their venerative invocation rituals. Before I begin, try to remember as a first principle rule that these cultures don't call them the Nephilim, or even demons necessarily, but refer to them as ancestor spirits, under the false pretense that they are the gods responsible for everything they have. And these archaic rituals are performed in costume with the sole intention of being possessed by the ancestors and to be a vessel to channel them. That being said, when one thinks of the biblical Nephilim described in detail in the Book of Enoch and other pseudepigraphical texts, the desire to eat human flesh and drink the blood wouldn't be the top of the list, but it was certainly a point mentioned repeatedly. So it would be worth seeing if we can find any evidence that the eating of humans was still practiced today by those tribes who also display Nephilim-esque features in their ritualistic garb. The island of New Guinea is the second largest in the world after Greenland. It's a mountainous, sparsely populated tropical landmass divided between two countries, the independent nation of Papua New Guinea in the east and the Indonesian provinces of Papua and West Irian Jaya in the west. The Korowai live in southeastern Papua and are infamous for their cannibalistic practices. Cannibalism was practiced among some ancient human beings and it did linger into the 19th century in some isolated South Pacific cultures, mainly in Fiji. But today, the Korowai are among the very few tribes believed to still eat human flesh, not counting the heinous practices of satanic cults and secret societies today, of course. They live about 100 miles inland from the Arafura Sea, which is where Michael Rockefeller, the son of the New York governor Nelson Rockefeller, disappeared in 1961 when collecting artifacts from another Papuan tribe. His body was never found. Most Karawai still live with little knowledge of the world beyond their homelands and frequently feud with one another. Some are said to kill and eat male witches they call Kakua. Based on a culture of revenge, the tribes people of the Karawai believe that it is only just to eat the Kakua witches, because they eat the insides of the tribesmen, who then appear to get incredibly sick and die. However, the way they decide to choose who is and isn't a shape-shifting spiritual cannibal among them appears to be on the word of a very sick and dying individual who randomly accuses another person with their last dying breath of eating their insides and causing the illness. That certainly is one way to make sure your enemies meet a brutal end once you're gone. Many have simply put this practice down to a misunderstanding on the rampant bacteria and disease present in swampy rainforests. Their life expectancy is very short as a result of their environment, so elder wisdom and discernment likely isn't present within these small communities, and with a lack of interference from the outside world, the tradition of eating witches is not questioned. The bones of the dismembered victims line the walkways and paths through their territory as a warning to others. Most other cultures who practiced cannibalism around the world and even in the same region did so as a means to instill fear in the hearts of their enemies or even to gain powers from eating specific organs of their now defeated enemies. The Karawai tribe's tradition of only eating male witches seems to differ from this norm. A reporter for the Smithsonian who travelled to meet the Karawai asked the tribes about their religious beliefs, and this is what he was told. Quote, Ken Beren and I spent the morning talking to Lepidon and the young men about the Karawai religion. Seeing spirits in nature, they find belief in a single god puzzling but they too recognize a powerful spirit named Ginol, who created the present world after having destroyed the previous four. For as long as the tribal memory reaches back, elders 
sitting around fires have told younger ones that white-skinned ghost demons will one day invade Korowai land. Once the Laleo arrive, white people, Gino will obliterate this fifth world and the land will split apart. There will be fire and thunder and mountains will drop from the sky. The world will shatter and a new one will take its place. The prophecy is, in a way, bound to be fulfilled as more young Karawai move between their tree houses and downriver settlements, which saddens me as I return to our hut for the night. End quote. As we just read, the Karawai fear some kind of white skinned ghost demon. So they consider Caucasians to be demonic in nature due to this strange form of historical fear that's instilled within them. However, as they likely never even met a Caucasian until recently, the instant reaction to assume the demonic should be questioned heavily. This prophecy of white-skinned ghost demons returning in the final days of the world sounds to me to be speaking of the return of the white-skinned, red-haired Nephilim that once plagued the ancient past, and not simply white people from Europe turning up, as naively interpreted by the Smithsonian reporter. I mean, the Nephilim interpretation at least explains the earth-shattering details of utter destruction that comes with them. White people have already turned up, and they didn't bring with them mountains falling from the sky and earthquakes and disaster. The Korowai universe is filled with a variety of spirits, some more personal of character than others. Another god said to be honoured is a red-headed creator god called Gimiji, giving more credence to the idea that these tribes have a strong and deeply woven memory of the Nephilim within their own cultures and stories. We can see this white skin red hair connection within the folk traditional body paint of another tribe inhabiting the same Balam Valley region, in the midst of the Jayawajia mountain range of Papua, Indonesia. The Yali, aka Lords of the Earth. Unlike the Karawai who dwell in tree houses within the dense rainforests, the Yali live in the virgin forest of the highlands and rocky plateau vantage points to aid in protection from warring enemy tribes. The Yali are officially recognised as pygmies, with men standing at just 150 centimetres tall. Now today, the Yali are majority Christian Protestant. Until the 1970s, there were reports of cannibalism, however, until the Christian missionaries stopped several feuds between villages and taught them the Gospels, causing old war rituals and ancestor cults to be slowly forgotten by the Yali. Yet here we find a photograph from Jimmy Nelson, an independent photographer, showing the Yali venerating through body art something very much antithetical to Christ. White skin with wild red hair like a clown wig. Could this be an invocation through body art of the red-headed Gamiji god mentioned earlier, who is well known to the neighbouring Karawai? Through my own research, I am inclined to believe this is another example of clown-featured Nephilim representations from a culture whose traditions haven't changed since they lived among these false idols and psychedelic gods in the ancient past. Other tribes in the Papua region showcase a variety of feathery headdresses and serpent-like body paint, just as we see in traditional ancestor worship garb of tribes found all over the earth. Note this photo taken from the photographer Jimmy Nelson and a Papuan tribe showcasing a bright red nose typical of a modern western clown and polka dot motifs with an intentional whitening of the skin, a clear veneration of something these cultures consider worthy of mimicking. These are all features that appear to have been amalgamated into the created caricature of a modern day clown and likely a source of inspiration for the clown's design, along with numerous other folk traditional motifs we have found in other cultures, 
when representing their ancestor spirits, a.k.a. the Nephilim. This one's a bit of a side note, but I think it might be pertinent to note that within the archipelagos of the Pacific region and the Southern Asian regions, it's common practice to chew a specific seed of a tree which turns the mouth of the chewer a garish orange colour, creating some rather grotesque effects. Though there's no reason to believe this is a direct result of Nephilim worship, it is worthy to say that they use this stimulant in their religious practices as offerings to the spirits. The eraser nut seriously negatively affects almost all organs of the human body, including the brain, heart, lungs, gastrointestinal tract, and reproductive organs. It affects the immune system, leading to the suppression of T-cell activity and decreased release of cytokines. It has harmful effects on fetuses when used during pregnancy. The nut literally kills them. Yet its addictive properties and ritual uses keep it alive and well within the culture, not unlike smoking tobacco in the West. Its origins appear to be ancient, with sources claiming that the practice of chewing this narcotic seed dates back as far as 3000 BC. It is believed that betel chewing originally developed somewhere within the Philippines shortly after the beginning of the Austronesian expansion, making this practice 5,000 years old or possibly older. This would put its creation roughly during the time or shortly after the Great Flood. Of course, this is pure speculation on my part, but it did say in the Book of Enoch that Semyaza taught enchantments and root cuttings and acquainted mankind with plants. And this story of mixing eraser nut with betel leaves reminds me of the oddly specific combinations of root and bark needed to create ayahuasca, a combination extremely unlikely to be discovered by virtue of mankind's random experimentation alone, perhaps showing that this land appears to have maintained many of its ancient practices from a time when angels and giants ruled and were teaching mankind all sorts of unsavoury things. The fact that this particular practice leaves its users with a large red clown-like grimace is a fun coincidence where my research is concerned. In conclusion to this episode, it seems there is much more to explore in this oceanic archipelago. And these types of cultures and traditions, which remain relatively untouched by modernity, give us immense insight into the ancient world and their practices. The oral traditions and mythologies are rife with Nephilim and feathered serpents iconography. Evil pale skinned spirits and monsters with wide grimaces and red hair and feathery motifs. The mud men of Papua New Guinea's Azura tribe, also known as Halosa, are those who wear a traditional costumes centered around masks made of mud. They live nearby the village of Goroka in the eastern highland province of Papua New Guinea. There is no agreed upon reason as to how the practice originated, but it is known for certain that they believe the mask represents evil spirits, who we know are the Nephilim spirits. These masks are similar in visage to the Gorgons of Greece mythology, or the demons of Asian and Indic tradition. As we continue to analyse folk representations of the demonic, it becomes clear that all cultures on every continent are haunted by the memory of something they all witnessed and obsessively represent through their own stylized rituals thereafter. And we see the clown-like motifs as a psychedelic thread binding them all together into a patchwork tapestry. Thanks for listening, guys. If you like what I do, please consider supporting me on Patreon. For $5 a month, you get access to an extra video every week, plus bonus content relating to the book. If you want to support the book directly, you can find links to the GoFundMe down below. Please consider joining our Telegram group, where we share ideas and talk about all sorts of things daily. I'll be back with more content this week, and of course, every Sunday, I'll be doing my live show at 8pm UK time. As always, guys, God bless.